Everybody, welcome to week two. Um, today is a concept-heavy lecture. Yay. Uh, those are the best lectures and the worst lectures um, because they can be quite challenging to uh, understand everything that's in there. Uh, specifically, I'm going to be talking about conceptual modeling today. And essentially, what we're going to talk about is data modeling for starters. And essentially, when you're talking about data modeling, you're exploring data structures, and it uses three key terms when you do this. Entities, instances, and attributes. I'll be going over those in a few minutes. But essentially, the whole point is you're going to explore what the data structures are around you. And surprisingly, things are fairly well structured when you actually start looking at it. Part of the challenge is learning how to think in a structured manner so that as you work through the data, you stay consistent. Okay, I'm going to start with some terminology. Now, database terminology can actually be pretty complex. Um, like pretty much any industry, they have a bunch of their own keywords, their buzzwords, and all kinds of stuff like that. 90% of it's useless, 10% is useful, and the 10% is what I'm going to cover today. If you choose to continue working with databases at a very low level, the rest of the terminology will suddenly become much more useful. But at an introductory level, that 10% is usually enough. The first piece of terminology is known as an entity type or an entity for short. They both, both things mean the same thing. An entity is an object that represents a thing. Any number of things. This could be a person, a people, places, events, and other things. And essentially, an entity is anything that you can collect data about, where there is more than one of them. So for example, a student is an entity, or an entity type. In other words, we can describe every student in the school, no matter how special you think you are, with the same basic set of criteria. And then, you know, the extra stuff that defines you as a special student goes off to the side. But every student can be defined the same way. So that's an entity type. Another example of an entity type you could run across on your daily commute would be bus routes. A bus route has a start, a stop, certain turns, certain places they have to stop at. But basically, put a bus route, a bus route, a bus route. Regardless of what the data that finds it is, you can describe it the same way. Start, stop, and number of stops. Um, another thing could be a concert. Did you know there's no difference between a Judas Priest concert and a Cher concert? Well, yeah, there's a big difference because yours are bleeding at one of them. And I'm not talking about Judas Priest. I'm kidding. Um, they both put on great shows. Um, but a concert's a concert. What defines a concert? A venue, number of available tickets, the act, how much the tickets cost. These are all the same things that every concert, whether you're going to the Canadian Tire Center or you go to the Brass Monkey, it's all the same. That's an entity type. An entity instance, on the other hand, is a particular instance of an entity type. Going back to students. An entity type is a student. An instance would be a specific student. So in this room, theoretically, I don't know what the number is right now because I haven't checked, but as of last week, there was 120 instances of students in this class. By the looks of the class, I'm probably down to about 116. <laughs> 115. So, but those are instances. Each of you are unique records in the student database. You all have specific things that define you, but each of you are an individual instance of a student. I am an instance of a professor. This is an instance of a course. Going back to the example of concerts, a Judas Priest concert is one kind of instance. The share concert's a different kind of instance. And 
you know, I'm using those two examples because I just went to a Jewish Priest concert and apparently I'm going to a Share concert. You know, it's one of those things. Don't close your minds. But, you know, that's what it is. Those are instances. So, an instance is a unique collection of data that defines something and it fits into a template, which is the entity type. So, yeah, I know it's only like week two of Java class, and I've heard. But basically, you've heard maybe what a class is, an object. No, okay, moving on. I'm not going to use that as an example. Okay, now, there's also something called a strong entity. So, we define what an entity is, we define what an instance is. A strong entity is an entity that is not, is not dependent on another entity for its existence. It always will have its own primary key. Each instance can be uniquely identified. So for example, technically each student is a strong entity. It doesn't depend on any other entities for existence. You all have a student number. Therefore, you all have a primary key. That means thanks to the student number, you can all be uniquely identified within the school system. Even if you have other people with the same name as you, your number uniquely identifies you in our system. That is a strong entity. It doesn't require anything else to help define it. On the other hand, the weak entity is like the boyfriend who can't be defined without the girlfriend. Right? His entire existence is defined by his significant other. It requires a strong entity to exist. And if there is no strong entity, the weak entity cannot exist. An example of this if I go back to how things used to be done, it would be an order or an invoice. Well, the words are interchangeable realistically. You cannot have an order line unless you have an order. For you go to the grocery store, you buy three or four things. You get a receipt, right? Technically, that is an invoice. Your receipt is an invoice or an order, depending on how I want to look at it. But each of those things that they sold to you cannot exist unless there's a complete sale, bill of sale done. That is associated to a single trans set of transactions. So one transaction is you bought you know, two pounds of bananas, a bag of apples, and a bag of chips. Three things are put into your transaction. That one transaction allows those three items to be sold to you. Without the transaction, it was never sold to you. Which is a little strange when, considering when you think about how Amazon works, where literally, even though you check out three things out of your basket, it treats every single one of those things as a separate order. Amazon does things a little weird. I used to use Amazon as an example until a student called me out on it, and I really had to retract what I was saying. They just treat orders kind of weird. Um, so a weak entity cannot exist unless something else defines it. That's the simple part of it. It normally has what's called partial keys. In other words, it doesn't have a primary key of its own. Its existence is based on other entities feeding values into it. And it uses what's called identifying relationships, which we're going to talk about that way later. Okay. So I would describe what an entity is. An entity is a thing. And what do you use to describe this thing? You use attributes. Attributes are basically descriptors. And I was going to use the Java example again, but I guess I'm not. Um, in theory, yes. Um, but essentially, when you have a class in Java and you create properties for it, that's the same thing as an attribute on an entity. An entity is the same thing as a class, an attribute is the same thing as a property. So, attributes describe an entity type. Well, I put type in brackets in case I you know, forget to say it. And it should be cohesive to your data needs. In other words, the attributes should apply to whatever it is you're trying to describe. So, once again, let's go talk about students, because, you know, that's a concept you guys should understand. You're a student. You have a student number. You have a name. Or more than one name. Or many names. 
depending where you're from. You have a date of birth. You have an identifying document number of some sort. If you're a Canadian citizen, you have a SIN number. If you're a foreign exchange student, you probably have a student visa number or a passport number. One of those things. Um, what else would you have to help you identify yourselves? A phone number or two? An email address? A living, a, an actual home address versus living, where are you living right now address? Um, those are all the basics of what would help define a student. Outstanding fees, et cetera, et cetera. These are all things that describe a student. But these are attributes. Everybody has these attributes in this room. Even as a prof, I have very similar attributes. I have an employee number. I have a couple of names. I've got an address. I've got a course load. You know, I've got fairly similar attributes. It's just flipped on the other side of the coin. So, for example, as a student, when I talk about needing cohesive attributes, it means that the attributes should be applicable to what you're defining. So if I'm defining a student, I shouldn't have to include your pay rate. Because you're not being paid to be here, you're paying to be here. On the other hand, I'm paid to be here. Right? So there's the two sides of the same coin, it's just, you know, similar things. Or another thing that might not apply as a student would be um, cost. How much do you cost? Doesn't really apply to a student. Well, you do. It does, but it doesn't. Um, but essentially, that's you know some of the examples that might not apply directly to a student. Um, if you wanted to talk about some other things, perhaps when you want to talk about a concert, you wouldn't talk about weight. Weight has nothing to do with a concert, so it's not cohesive to a concert. Maybe it's cohesive to the stuff they're putting up on the stage, but it has nothing to do with the concert itself. Those are non-cohesive, therefore you wouldn't collect that information. The next thing we have to think about after we've got things fairly cohesive is whether things are required or optional. Required means that for an entity instance to exist, the attribute must have a value. For example, we cannot put you into the system without a name as a student, right? Unknown student number four. No, we don't, we can't do that. Anonymous student number four, I should say. Um, uh, but maybe you live at home, so therefore maybe you're currently living versus your billing address is different or the same. Maybe one of those does not apply because it's the same. Therefore, that would be an optional attribute. Phone number. Maybe you have a home phone number, but maybe you don't have a cell phone. Ha <laughs> ha That's funny nowadays saying maybe you not have a cell phone, but there might be two people in this room that don't have a cell phone. Three people? So it's getting pretty rare where we get the instance of no cell phones. But by the same token, that's, you know, a cell phone could be an optional field as opposed to a home phone number which might be required. So that's the difference between a required and an optional field. Now, you have to be careful when you talk about required. If you make something required, it means that it must be supplied when you define an instance. So I'm going to define an instance of a student. So their name is John Doe, and their identifying document number is required. That means we can't put John Doe into the system unless we have their identifying document, which sometimes it gets a little weird, right? Where, especially if you're a foreign exchange student, you could come in and apply, put in your basic basis of your fees, but you don't have your student visa number yet. Therefore, the system, you're in the system as a registered student, but they don't have your visa number yet. So therefore, what are they going to do? And I don't mean credit card for the Canadian students that don't know what I'm talking about. It's a piece of paper that says you're actually allowed to come here to learn. Right, and there's a number on it, and that's the school used that to identify you. If you don't have that piece of paper, you're not allowed to be in the country to learn. And then if you don't have that, they send you home. Or you never get to come in the first place. 
But, you know, at first, after you've applied and been accepted, you may not have that number yet because you're still waiting for your government to take its time stamping pieces of paper to say you're allowed to do this. So, possibly that would be an optional attribute. A phone number is usually required because we have to be able to get a hold of you. Or at least get a hold of your parents if something goes horribly wrong. Now, since we've talked about attributes, there's also another kind of attribute. There's simple versus composite. Now, a simple attribute is an, an easy one for everybody to understand. It's a single atomic piece of data. Now, there once was a time where people thought an atom was the smallest particle that couldn't be broken down. Obviously, we've proven very well that an atom can be broken down. Right? Things go boom when you break down an atom a little further. However, somewhere along the way, they coined the term atomic, meaning it's the smallest piece of data that cannot be broken down. An example of that would be your date of birth. Your date of birth is your date of birth. Pfft, done. It's an atomic piece of data. Yes, theoretically you could break it down by month, day, year, but why the heck would you? It's pointless. The database servers have the ability to maintain dates. Another one would be your SIN number for Canadian citizens. It's a self-contained piece of information. It cannot be broken down any further. I just like waving to students when they leave. I don't know. That's what it is. It cannot be broken down. End of story. A composite, on the other hand, when you're at the conceptual stage, a composite would be something like an address, where realistically you know it can be broken down into smaller pieces. However, at the concept stage, you're not going to take the time to break it down to its smallest pieces. When you think about an address, you have street address 1, sometimes street address 2, you know. For example, 123 Sum Street, Unit 5. Some people put it all in one line, usually it's on two lines. You have a city. You have a political division, also known as a state, province, county, insert other way of wording this. A postal code. Pretty much every country in the world has postal codes. And then a country. So an address is made out of address, address, city, province, postal code, six pieces of data. But when you think about an address at the conceptual level, an address is an address, right? Therefore, it's a composite. It's made up of multiple pieces. And essentially, that's what it is. It's a group of pieces. So composite attributes only exist at the conceptual and the logical level. Later on, when you learn about physical design, you cannot have composite attributes. It's a no-no. They will be, you have to blow them up into component pieces so they can be handled properly. Now, single-valued versus multi-valued attributes. Again, the single-valued is the easy one to understand. It's an attribute that has only one value inside of it at a time. One and only one. Date of birth. Does anybody in here have more than one date of birth? And I don't want to hear about the leap year kids. Because those people actually do have two dates of birth. They have their legal date of birth and then the system date of birth, which is usually March 1st. Why? Because more, a lot of systems can't handle leap years. They can, but they just doesn't do the math properly for certain things, so that everybody gets put in as March 1st or February 28th, depending on which side of noon they're at. Um, but date of birth, everybody in here has a single real date of birth. That's a single-valued attribute. A multi-valued attribute, on the other hand, is a list of possible values. For example, skills that you have. An example of a set of skills would be, if you're a carpenter, you can measure, you can cut straight, you can hammer in a nail. I'm being really basic here. And I shouldn't use a carpenter because, I mean, that's really hard work, actually. But I'm just saying, you know, uh, if you look at software developers, some of the skill sets they'll have is version control. 
That's an important skill to learn. The sooner you learn it, the better. And I don't think you even get a course on it. So, you know, it's a good thing to invest on your own. Um, programming language, Java, or PHP, or Python. Insert language here, C sharp. Yada, 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 languages, there's thousands of them. Database skills, SQL, design, those are all skills. In theory, when you list off what skills do you have, a person it almost comes out as a common delimited list, right? When you start talking about what do you know? I can color with crayons. I can tie my shoes. I finished grade one. Good job, but it's a common delimited list. A multi-valued list of values, in other words, known is also known as a repeating group of values. And those during normalization, which is lecture in two weeks, um, end up being converted to their own entities. In other words, if you can list off a list of things as part of an item, really it should be its own entity. How many people here have assembled something from Ikea in the last three weeks? Be honest. Okay, yeah, me too. There was a couch, it sucked. Um, essentially, if you think about it, you'll have a parts list, right, for your uh, purchase from Ikea. You'll have, you know, it's a car, something or other. My daughter works at Ikea, so I, you know, I hear all these weird names all the time. Right, you got this thing, and it has, you know, 26 screws and 25 of this, and it's missing two of these, and on and on and on, right? Plus all the big actual boards and stuff. That's a list of parts, but realistically, each of those things is a part, a single part. Therefore, that probably should be an own, its own entity. Not each part be its own entity, but there should be an entity describing parts that's related to the thing that you're buying. So things that are multi-valued, or also known as a repeating group, should be broken down to its own entity at, its own, at one point or another. I'll be doing a, an example, time permitting, today. All right. Stored versus derived. Believe it or not, this is the one that most people have no problems understanding. A stored attribute is an attribute that actually stores a value. For example, date of birth. I keep going back to that one because everybody has a date of birth. So everybody should understand that concept, unless you're a clone. But then is it the moment you're poured out of the tub? So, I mean, you still have a moment you came into existence. But you have a date of birth. So, a stored attribute is a date of birth, for example. It's a, a stored value, etc. However, a derived attribute is one that can be calculated. If you can express it as a mathematical operation, you don't need to store it, except for performance reasons. For example, would you store a person's date of birth and their age? Why would you bother? How do you calculate the person's age? Now minus date of birth. Yes, it's time math. Time math sucks. It's the worst kind of math, because it's dumb. Because there's no set base units of anything, right? 60, 365, 24, you know, all these things don't add up. There's no base unit to work with. Date, date math is the worst kind of math. But if we want to talk about um, inventory, which is another concept most of us should understand. You know, you go to Walmart, you go grab yourself some nacho chips and they're all gone. Because, you know, Super Bowl's coming and the chips are all gone. Now, inventory is the amount we have in the store minus how many we sold equals how many we have left. Therefore, what we need to store is how many do we have, how many did we sell, but we don't need to store how many we have left because we take this one minus that one gives you the third value. Anything that can be calculated does not need to be stored. It's known as derived. Derived attributes can exist at the conceptual and logical stages. So when you're doing the conceptual logical design, feel free to include the derived attributes so that they're not lost or forgotten. But once you get to the physical design, in other words, when you're doing the final implementation of your design, don't include them unless you have a really good reason. Another, another example of things that are stored regularly that are derived, but not necessarily stored, is an order total. Right? We bought two pounds of bananas at 
79 cents a pound. A bag of chips for three bucks. Holy shit, chips are expensive now. Um, and a bag of cookies for three bucks, right? So six bucks plus whatever it is. Dollar, dollar sixty. So seven sixty. Technically, we don't need to store the seven sixty because we can add up the line totals. But we don't even need to store the line totals because, for example, the bananas are about two pounds and seventy nine cents a pound, right? So therefore, if the price is seventy nine times two, even the line total doesn't need to be stored. Same thing if you bought three bags of chips at three bucks. Three times three is nine. Line totals are even derived attributes. You don't need to store those, but for large corporations that have lots and lots of data, they end up storing these things also just for performance reasons. For example, Amazon. Going back to Amazon. Can you imagine if every single transaction you had to recalculate every line total for every customer? Every single time you look at one of your orders, there are millions of customers that are hitting their site every minute. You can't do that, so they'll, they'll store their derived attributes just for performance gains. On the other hand, if you're a shop like T-Fury, there's no reason to store the derived attributes because your volume is not that high. It's high, but it's not like Amazon high. So the derived attributes are fine to store it like that. So a small shop, it's okay to have derived attributes. Do not store them. Bigger companies, you may need to store them for performance reasons. Okay, attributes five and keys one. Now, there's something called an identifier attribute, also known as a key. That's why I wore this little clip today. Keys. I don't have a title for every event. This is the only one that applies. But keys. It's something that uniquely identifies you or an item. So when you think about the school, what's your unique identifier here at the school? Your student number. As far as the Canadian government is concerned, what is your identifying number? Your SIN number. Or if you're American, your SSN. If you're somewhere else in the world, I don't know what it's called. In England, it's called the NIN, N-I-N, National Identification Number. Different parts of the world, they all do the same thing. Those are unique they're identifier attributes. They can be made up of more than one attribute for some unknown reason. Some people like doing compound keys. Personally, I think they're a terrible idea. Uh, why? Because you need to maintain more than one key to make sure everything's unique. If you, but the problem is also is that, for example, we can't use the SIN number as a unique identifier. Why? Because the Canadian SIN numbers actually overlap with some other countries' identifiers, and you end up with the same number in the database at the same time, so it cannot be unique. You can also can also use a SIN number as a unique identifier because not everybody has a SIN number that attends the school. You might have a passport number in its place, or you may have a student visa number, or insert whatever else here. There's three or four things they can use to, as an identification for you. The problem is that it's not unique to every student. Thus, you end up with a student number. Those are known as keys, things that let you identify records uniquely. Now, <coughs> keys part two. There is candidate and primary keys. Now, I already discussed composite keys. In other words, it's a key that's made up of more than one attribute. For example, if we chose to, you could use a student's name and their identifying number as your unique key, theoretically. The odds of somebody having the same first name, middle name, last name, plus the same number as their you know, government-issued ID number, pretty small. Um, not unheard of. It's pretty small. So that would be a compound key. Personally, I just like giving you guys a student number, and there you go, it's one number. So therefore, we could have three John Does with one, two, three, four as a unique identifier, and it's all good. We have them in the system three times. Candidate keys are keys that could uniquely identify a row. Now, there is a difference between a candidate key and a primary key. The candidate key happens at the logical stage and the conceptual stage. In other words, what I'm talking about right now, 
the primary key happens at the logical and physical stage. So when you talk about conceptual design, we talk about candidate keys. In other words, we think this combination of fields will make a record unique. So when we talk about students, we think this combination of attributes of a student will make it unique. Or we think this combination of attributes will make a concert unique. So maybe date, venue, and artist would make a concert unique. Odds are you're not going to have two bands playing at the exact same time at the same venue. <coughs> Stranger things have been known to happen. But, you know, the odds of two acts happening at the same time, same place, are pretty small. Those are candidate keys. When the design is complete, you will take one of those candidate keys and convert it into a primary key. The primary key becomes law. Every row has a primary key. Every table has a primary key. There is a, that primary key is used to uniquely identify that piece of data. So here's the school. Your student number is your primary key. They can find you in any of the systems here using that number. Simple enough. Before they decided that your student number is going to be your primary key, I think way back in the 70s, they actually used identification number and name. And then they gave you a number once you were put into the system. But up until then, that's the two pieces they used to identify you. That's why access is a little weird. Yes? A key is an attribute. An, attri an attribute may not be a key. Yes. So, for example, once again, describing a student. First name, middle name, last name, date of birth, phone number, phone number two, address one, address two, right? Those are not very few. And then there's identification, the government issued identification. Those are all attributes. How many of these can actually be used to uniquely identify you? Basically, the combination of your name and the government issued ID would probably do the trick. But even that's not 100% guaranteed, so we have something which I'm going to talk about in a few minutes, which is a synthetic key or surrogate key. Well, there's a magic number that gets created. So, that's the difference between a candidate key, so going back to where I was. That difference between a candidate key and a primary key is a candidate key is the data can be used to identify something. The primary key is when you've settled down and said, yes, that's what we're going to use. It's just further down the row, road down as you go through the design process. Once you've picked something, stick to it. OK, keys part two. When we're trying to pick out a candidate key, we're dealing with something called identifiers. Now, I've been describing various identifiers to you guys as we've been going. However, when you're picking an identifier, there's a few things you should choose. Number one, it will never change its value. Which leads me back to some of the choices I was describing earlier. You got people with their names. People change names. It's actually surprisingly easy to do. Totally screws up your credit report. But it's entirely doable. Your name can change. Now, some people say, well, your SID number doesn't change. Ha, have you ever had your identity stolen? I can guarantee your SID number is going to change real fast after your identity gets stolen. Um, you know, because things happen. Now, the other thing you want is you want to make sure it can't be null. Now, have, the, have you guys learned about null yet? Do you actually understand the concept of null versus learning about it? That is the point. It cannot change. It must not change. It must be immutable, if you want the big word. Pardon? Well, that's the problem we're having nowadays. Things change. Our numbers change. Like SIN numbers can change. Your passport number changes. You know when you go renew your passport, your passport number changes. Parts of it change. Your health card. Who here's renewed their health card recently? 
Did you ever notice that part of the number change, the last two numbers, the version code at the end changes? So your, your health card number changes also. Our numbers are changing for various reasons. SIN numbers change if your identity gets stolen because, well, that's what you have to do. Um, no, there's all kinds of things that go with that, like that. Um, and the other thing is it cannot be null. Back to asking, do you guys understand the meaning of null? No. It's absence of value. It's not the same thing. Which, especially in the world of database, when you're working in Java, realistically, a lot of people in Java will have a hard time telling the difference between a null and a no value. A null is an absence of value. And in other words, you've made a box in space, and there's vacuum inside. Sure. Yeah, well, in database, it exists, but there's nothing there. So this is one of the first trip-ups that a lot of people have when they're coming from other, other industries or other disciplines of computers, and they deal with database, is databases actually rec recognize nulls as being nulls. It's an actual value. And the value is absence of value. Sounds dumb, but, you know, that's what it is. And an empty means it's empty, as in, you know, there's a string in here, but a zero-length string is still a string, as opposed to this can hold a string, but there's nothing inside. So a primary key can never be null. In other words, there must always be something provided for it. You should avoid intelligent identifiers. And <coughs> a lot of profs used to teach that intelligent identifiers were a great thing. And then the students go out in the real world and then they get slapped in the back of the head by their supervisors, saying, what the hell is wrong with you? You don't use intelligent identifiers. They, these are things that might change. For example, a person's name. Yesterday, the person's name was John. Today, they're Jane. Tomorrow, they're going to be Frank. And then next day, they're a different symbol because they just keep changing their name every day. You can't use names. Locations. Hey, let's use this person's address, their postal code, as their unique identifier. That's really useful. Do you ever happen, the, like the rooming houses, where you have five students living in one house? You all have the same postal code. And then one of you has a falling out with everybody else, and they move out. Suddenly, your postal code no longer is your identifier because it changes. That's called an intelligent identifier. One that's really popular, that used to be really popular, is phone numbers. Because there once was a time where your phone number didn't change very much. And nowadays, phone numbers like underwear. You know, you're getting too many calls on your cell. You go to your cell phone and say, I want a new phone number. 30 seconds later, you got a new phone number. Like it's so easy to change your phone number now. It's stupid. There you go, one new number? Yes, give me the 50 bucks. That was a good 30 seconds for 50 bucks. So, avoid intelligent identifiers. Use identifiers that have no real-world meaning. So, in other words... Come up with something that doesn't have meaning in the real world that where the values can change. Once all the time, send numbers were safe, but they're not safe anymore. Passport numbers were safe, they're not safe anymore because they changed the passport numbers and the version codes now. Uh, the other thing is you have really long comp composite keys, like a composite key that's made up of three or four things. Dump it. Come up with something simple, which will lead me to one of the next topics. Actually, it leads me to the very next topic. So, in the end, after I describe that, you can't use a person's SIN number as a unique identifier. You can't use their name. You can't use their address or their phone number. You can't use any of these things. How do you identify a person? I guess quite challenging. So, someone somewhere had a brainstorm. They said, hot damn, I've got the answer. What was the answer? They came up with something called surrogate keys. Surrogate keys also are also known as synthetic keys. They're artificial keys. 
it is a column, also known as an attribute, that has a unique identifier that is assigned using the database. No external process involved. Totally self-contained inside the database, there is a attribute that will self-populate with values. The values going to them, they're unique. They cannot be repeated. And since they have no real-world meaning, they will never change. So every single time a row is added to the database, the surrogate key gets its unique value. Normally, they're very short. They have numeric, and they never change. We use numbers. One, two, three, four, five. Once two is used, you can never use it again. Yay for us. You don't ever defragment your primary keys, your surrogate keys. So if you delete number two, you never get to reuse number two. You can't say, oh, one, space, three, four, five, space, space, eight. You know, just because there's gaps, that's too bad. For those that are anal retentive, we'll make sure all their numbers are in sequence. That's too bad. You've got to get over it. Those are ideal as primary keys for a few reasons. One, they have no real world meaning. They have no what's called business meaning. Two, because they're numbers, they're fast to look up. They're the fat, numeric values are the fastest lookups in the database. Three, the values are determined by the database itself. Although I'm up to four because I use two figures at the same time. They're defined by the database. That means you don't have to trust the programmers to set it. As a person that does both database design and development, I never trust the programmer. Ever. I'll do my database design in such a way that the programmer doesn't need to, has to do as little as possible. And I'm the one writing the code against my database. So I know, I'm insulting myself here as I'm saying it. But as a rule of thumb, most database designers never trust the developers. Why? Because they don't read the instructions and the documentation. They just go and do whatever the heck they want. That's a fact of life. Um, so if you use a surrogate key, you don't have to worry about the programmer setting a value because the surrogate key takes care of it for them. <coughs> now we have foreign keys. That one gets a little sketchy, and I'm going to talk about it at a very light level today. Um, I'm going to talk about it more in detail uh, next week, I think. Uh, foreign keys is an attribute whose value comes from another attribute. For example, each of you have a database. Let's pretend it's a really simple structure here. Each of you have a database prof attribute. and how do, what, do you know what the database prof is? It's me. And therefore, you cannot have this database course without me. Therefore, I have a primary key of database prof, and you guys have a foreign key of me. So the database, each of your database prof foreign keys is populated by me. Or if you're in a different section, you'd have Kumari, Saif, or Eugene. It'd be one of those other names, or Santa. Sorry, there's four. almost forgot about Santa. So if you're in a different section, you'd have one of the other profs. But it's still, at that point, there's a prof that is a primary key on another entity. You guys are students that have a database course. That's the, you know, foreign key. You're connected to me via that. Um, another example would be... Uh, it's really hard to talk about these concepts with actual physical examples. Um, car dealerships. Let's go with that one. So you've got a car dealership. Okay. Anybody in here not know what a car dealership is before I continue? It's a person that's a company that sells you cars. So that's a car dealership. Okay. There's, you know, real car dealerships and there's the sketchy car dealerships. You know, you got the, like, the Campbell Fords and the Delaris and those guys, those are formal car dealerships. And then you got the guys just off Saint Laurent in the back corner where their office is a shack. 
You think I'm I'm joking. Some of them are pretty sketchy. They change names every six months. So those are car dealerships. And a car dealership normally has cars for sale. So each of those cars is owned by the car dealership. That means the car has a foreign key. Its foreign key is populated by the dealership that owns it. Does that make a little more bit of sense? The car dealership owns the cars. And the ownership of the car gets its value based on something else outside. When they sell you the car, the ownership of the car goes away from the car dealership and it becomes yours, theoretically. So that's, you know, car dealerships. That's a foreign key. So you some, basically, it's a connection between two entities. Normally, the foreign key gets its value from a primary key of another table. Okay. I'm going to go back to the surrogate key versus the natural key bit. Okay, so one piece terminal, yeah. Well, I was going to be spending more time on it next week. Uh, but essentially, a foreign key is an attribute whose value comes from another entity. So, for example, your last name comes from one of your parents. Okay, well, go with that. Theoretically, in most cultures, your last name comes from one of your parents. So we're going to use that as a base example. So, you know, that's a, that's a foreign key. And a simplest, most basic example. All right. So I'm going to discuss again the difference between surrogate keys and natural keys. Now, a composite key we already discussed. It's a key that's made up of multiple attributes. And a natural key is a key that's formed from attributes that already exist in the real world. SIN numbers, SSNs, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Synthetic keys, also known as a sword key, is a key that has no business meaning. So we're going to get some terminology dealt with here. In other words, it's a value that exists with no meaning outside the database server. The primary key is the preferred key for an entity type, and a foreign key is one or more attributes in an entity that refers to another entity. So those are the term that's good terminology to know how. However, there are issues in why we don't use natural keys. Problem number one, the size. Now, natural keys are big. Now, a lot of computers, people say, oh, my computer's got like a two terabyte drive. Ha ha ha, what's space? Durr. But there once was a time where we really cared about space. I remember days when a 25 megabyte hard drive was a big hard drive. I'm dating myself a little bit, but you know, I've seen where you know, when a 25, a 25 megabyte hard drive was this big, about that tall. You could actually see the discs spinning inside because they were such marvels of technology, they actually put glass enclosures on them. So people felt good about their, their $10,000 they spent on it. But, you know, these were what these things did. And we cared about space. Now, numeric surrogate key of natural keys aren't that bad because they can be fairly compressed. But if you're dealing with somebody's name and you have, let's go with, let's make fun of uh, Quebec names for a second. Right? Anne-Marie Bourriau Saint-Jean. That's a long mouthful. We didn't even talk about her middle name yet. All right, that's a big, long name. And you have to store all of that. And when you do it as a primary key, it has to index that. I'll talk about indexes way later in the term, but yeah, it has to be indexed. Indexes take up room. Surrogate keys is a number. And normally, for an 8-bit integer, which goes into a huge number, if you don't know how big an 8-bit integer is, it's massive. Uh, it'll hold, you know, huge numbers. The thing is, is that numbers are easy to sort, they're easy to search for. And since these things are usually incremental, they're stored in order anyways in the database. One, two, three, four, five. Okay, problem number two with natural keys. 
relates to problem number one, foreign key size. If the primary key is big, the foreign key is going to be big. Therefore, if we need 64 bytes to store the primary key, you'll need 64 bytes to store the foreign key. You're doubling data needlessly. Now, aesthetics. Aesthetics. It's an eye of the beholder kind of thing. Some people don't like the look of surrogate keys because it's a number. They go, oh, it's a number. It makes no sense. That's okay. It's a number. Deal with it. But it also makes your code a lot easier to read. Select star from student where ID is 0, 4, 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. As opposed to select star from student where name, first name is equal to this and last name is equal to that and identifying number is this, this, or this. You know, the queries are much longer, much more complex. And then problems number four and five, optional, optionality and applicability. Surrogate keys don't care if you don't provide all the data. Why? Because the database server assigns it. It's created automatically. Let's say you come from a place in the world where you actually only have one name. And there actually are a few countries in the world where people only have one name. I don't know how the hell that works, but, you know, they have one name. Or some other places in the world don't track certain pieces of information. Like, you may not have a phone number. You might not have a postal code. Insert other thing here. Serious synthetic keys don't care because they don't really exist. They're just a piece of information. Again, uniqueness is another problem that natural keys have. Why? Because a Canadian SIN number can overlap with a British NIN number, which can also overlap with an American SSN number. Theoretically, they can overlap over each other. Same thing with phone numbers. Just because in Canada you have 613-555-1212, doesn't mean that somewhere else in the world there isn't a 613-555-1212 with just a different country code in front of it. You know, there could very well be a number in England, 044613. That's just what it is. Therefore, not those things are not guaranteed to be unique. That means synthetic keys are guaranteed to be unique because the database server makes sure they are. Number seven, privacy. Now, can you imagine... If every single time you went up to the registrar's office and you were at the little kiosk and say, can I have your SIN number, please? I can look you up and you have to say it out loud every single time. Yeah, not so good. Or if that person was a little bit unscrupulous or there's a key logger installed on their computer and they type in your SIN number every single time. It's not necessarily a good thing. Also, with some of the new laws that are coming in effect, GDPR for Europe and the new laws happening in California, the less unique identifiable stuff you have for a person, the better for you. Synthetic keys have no real world meaning. That means if somebody knows you are 0401234 at Algonquin College, they can't use that number for anything else in the world. It has no meaning. Uh, accidental denormalization. You can't accidentally denormalize synthetic key because it has no business meaning. It can't be broken down. I'll talk about denormalization later. Cascading updates. This is one of the best ones. All right. So let's say we're using a person's name as your primary key. John Doe. John Doe went and had some surgery done. Now they're Jane Doe. And Jane Doe, now used as your primary key, you have to update everything that has John Doe to be Jane Doe. That means you've got to update every, all the foreign keys, everything else. You've got to crawl through the whole system and update all this information. If you're using a synthetic key, you look up, oh, let's look up number 44. Oh, they're Jane Doe now. Done. And 44 is propagated through the system. Who cares what 44 actually means? Same thing with the last one, which is varchar join speeds. 
Searching on strings takes a long time. This is not something you guys know yet, but and I don't mean inside the database, I'm talking even in Java, dealing with strings is slow. Strings are slow. Why? Because computers don't understand strings. We've made libraries so computers pretend they understand strings, but they don't actually know what a string is. As far as the computer is concerned, a string is an order of bytes. Anybody here ever have to type stuff in French? Alt 0, 135? Ring a bell? Alt 0, 0, 32, 1? Alt 0, 32? Uh, 36 is CCD, if I remember right. Just saying. You know, they're just numbers, and the computer has to translate all your letters into numbers, and then it does the searches against that, so you're adding all kinds of extra crap to it for it to do searches. So if you're joining across strings, it's got to do all that magic work against every single string all the way through. It's terrible. Now, some people, now you'll have the purists that like natural keys, they'll come around and go, there's problems with surrogate keys. They say there's problems getting the next value. As you can see, I censored it on the slide, but I'm not going to censor it when I say it out loud. It's bullshit. Absolute bull. All servers now support auto-incrementing. What does auto-increment mean? It means that the server adds one to the number. Every time you pull the next number, you go, give me a number five, give me a number six, give me a number seven. You know when you go somewhere and you press a little button, it gives you a ticket number? You got your little number, now you're all proud. You're number 55 and they're on three. <sighs> going to be here for a while. But yeah, you got your number. And nobody else will be B55 for the rest of that day. There could be an A55, but there won't be a B55. If it's auto-incrementing, who cares how it gets the next value? People shouldn't see them. The next complaint that you'll get is users don't understand them. So it's like I'm saying, some of the older database guys will talk about that. If you ever have to deal with one of these crusty guys, <coughs> I'm talking people before my time. They'll say users don't understand them. They don't understand what, why Jane Doe is now is number 44. Why is Jane Doe 44 as opposed to John Doe 44? Why is that person 44? Who cares? I don't care if you understand why I have a sword key or not. They shouldn't even be looking at them. They shouldn't even see them. Now, sometimes there are times where you get a sword key that is publicly visible. Your student number. Do you think anybody in here doesn't actually understand what a student number is? Honestly? It's a number that identifies you. Not much else to explain to that. Actually, the funny thing is, is your just generation of people actually are the first generation that truly understands having a number attached to you. Like we understood, my generation understands the concept of the SIN number. But even then, people still had problems with, you know, having a number attached to them. Nowadays, people don't care. We've all learned to accept the fact that we have numbers. That's just how it is. Especially when you start working with data. The more you work with data, the more you realize you're just another number. It's what you do out there that makes the difference, but you're still just a number. Who cares, in other words, if you're just a number? Extra joins. Sometimes you have to do extra joins. Woo! That's later down the term. Technically, that's true, but it makes such a small difference that who cares? Okay, this is the one that's real. Extra indexes. The only time you'll ever have a good argument against surrogate keys. So, for example, let's say you have a table with a SIN number, a phone number, and the surrogate key. If you're doing the synthetic one, you could do the SIN number and the phone number combined, so that'd be one index. You'd also have an index for each of those fields, so you have three. Now, if you have a surrogate key, you end up having what they call n plus one. In other words, you have an index for your SIN number, you have an index for the phone number, you might have a combination index between the two, then you have your surrogate key index. You always have one extra index. That's the biggest complaint you have against surrogate keys. Later on when I talk about indexes, you'll understand why people complain about indexes. But essentially, when you deal with surrogate keys, you'll always have n plus one. <coughs> Woo. It occupies a bit extra space on your disk. Back in the day of the 20 byte hard drives, we cared. Nowadays, not so much. Okay. 
What time is it? Eight. Yeah, we're ahead of schedule. Good. Relationships part one. A relationship is a connection between two entities. So I'm done talking about entities I'm talking and their attributes. I'm talking about things that connect them. It's a connection between two or more entities. And it allows for an organized data structure, basically put. In other words, if nothing was interconnected with relationships, the data would just be a mess. Everything's just floating around. You have no idea what's connected to what. <coughs> now, we got the most common type. One to many. Now, this is the most, like I said, this most common type of relationship. Normally, its terminology is parent-child. Um, there used to be another phrase, which is no longer as popular now, which is master-slave. Hey, there are actually a lot of program languages are getting rid of the phrase master-slave out of their language. Apparently. Because some people got upset. But, you know, so basically put, you have a parent-child relationship. And this one's the easiest one to describe. Even, sorry guys, this doesn't apply to you. I'm not trying to be sexist. A mother can have many children. A child can only ever have one mother. Technically, a father can have many children. And each child can only have one father. It's just, you know, the, it doesn't always go the right way that way. So I like to use the mother-child example. So, an example. A teacher can have many students. So, as a database prof, I have many students. You guys have one database prof. One to many. No. I'm insinuating I'm your database father. I will impart knowledge into your head, whether you want it or not. Even if I take you out back behind the shed. If you want to start talking about the father examples. Now, one to many. Another example is a transaction at the grocery store. You can buy many things, but it's in one transaction. So your receipt will have, you know, two pounds of bananas, a bag of chips, and a bag of cookies. Yay. One to many. That's the easiest one to understand. People grasp that fairly easily. You guys are a single student. You have many courses you're subscribed to. Well, this ends up being a many, many job, but, you know, that's how it is. Okay. Many to many. Also known as the Kentucky relationships. If you don't get that reference, go look up Hillbilly. You'll know exactly what I'm talking about. Now, it means it's multiple relationships between two tables. In other words, you've got two entities, and they're interrelated. And it is a nightmare to maintain. The relational model does not really support it. The conceptual model does. The relational model does not grasp many to many. It cannot be done. Um, to be able to do a many to many, we have something called an associative entity. In other words, we create an artificial entity that sits in the middle as a bridge between the two. Now, to go back, to give you an example of many to many and how bad it is, because I've been in the industry for a long time and I've inherited databases. And we had this one database where we had two tables and one record was related to another record. The other table, that sounds normal, right? One relationship. This one was related to another record in this one. This one was related to another record in this one. It looked like a giant cross stitch. And one day, my boss came to me and says, Dan, we need to clean out the records a little bit. Can you get rid of these three records? Because, you know, they're causing grief and people are confused. Dan goes, oh, sure, no problem. Delete from da 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 where blum. Then I sat there and he grind, was grinding for a while. And I was sitting there grinding and grinding and grinding, and Dan's going, oh, no, 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 slow computer today. I'm like, oh, shit. Of course, there's no control C. 
And the first thing you're going to learn when you're in the working database later is there's no such thing as undo. I deleted one row and it nuked 27,000 rows because they went down through the whole set of relationships until they reached the bottom and started deleting backwards. It was spectacular. I had a backup from three hours earlier. Hey, it wasn't my problem. I wasn't the one told to delete that. I was the one told to delete. I just did what I was told. That was my CYA of the day. It's when I discovered everything has to be in writing before it comes across my desk <laughs> in the future. So, yeah. Now, many, many is frowned upon because of problems like that. So, an associated entity bridges two or more tables. Um, essentially, we create an artificial entity to allow things to be interconnected. And I am going to write on the board. I'll try to write big. So, what kind of marker is this guy using? So if you have employee and skills. Now, I talk about this notation later, but this is a many-to-many -many relationship. An employee can have many skills, and each skill can be assigned to more than one employee. This is a nightmare to maintain. Why? Because if you delete an employee, it'll take out the skill, and if the skill exists on somebody else, it'll take out those people too until it, you, know, you have nothing left in your database. So somewhere along the way, somebody said, you know what would be a great thing if we did? We'll create an associative entity. I do talk about the notation a little bit later, but in other words, we have an, ed an entity in the middle. An employee can have many skills. Each skill can be assigned to many employees. If we fire an employee, it takes us out the records out of here, but we still have a full list of skills. If we get rid of a skill, we can get rid of the skill out of here, but we don't fire our employees. This is known as an associative entity or a bridge table. It's the simplest concept once you grasp it, but it takes a while to understand until you play with it. And then there's the one-to-one. -one. It's very rare. And often it's used to divide very large tables. So you've got very big tables with hundreds of columns. And some people say, oh, that's terrible. It's hard to work with. Let's break it up into multiple pieces. Okay, let's go over, we'll get right on that. Break it down, multiple pieces, and then you have a shared primary key. So each table has the same primary key. That means the increment at the same time, somehow. However, there are a few valid reasons. Now, you want to isolate part of the original table for security reasons. And this is becoming more and more common. Um... If we store a person's SIN number, technically we're supposed to encrypt it now. Technically. If we store uh, credit card numbers, that should be stored in an encrypted location. There once was a time where that would be all part of the customer record and it was all in plain text. Encrypting the entire record is a nightmare. Therefore, instead of encrypting the entire record, what do you do? You break down, take off what needs to be secured, put another table and just encrypt those pieces. Is encryption takes time. And the whole point of a database server is to not waste time. Or you could use it to sh store short-term data that you can delete. Session information on a website. Um, your shopping cart. As you go through a website, you have a shopping cart after 24 hours, maybe they'll just delete it to keep the database clean. That kind of stuff. Or to store a subset of data that only applies to part of the original table. Which, even that, I find a hard excuse to accept 
for example, you have a user profile. We have a second table that says, oh, this is his preferred font. This is his preferred color for our website. This is his avatar. This is his ICQ number. For those of you that remember ICQ, if you don't, you're too young. Um, you know, these are things that, that might only apply to certain parts of the data. Therefore, you create a table just for that. Okay. Relationships part five. Cardinality and optionality. Now, these are two more phrases. As I warned you guys this was a brutal lecture. Cardinality rep represents how many? One or more. Optionality means is it required or not? For example, can an order exist without a customer? No. Can a receipt exist from the grocery store without you buying something? No. That is optionality, as in, can this exist without something else? The answer is no, it cannot, and therefore it's not optional. A customer can exist without buying anything, technically. The second you walk into the store, you're a customer until you walk back out without anything. But you're still a customer while you're wandering around in the store. Now, I swear I had the symbology on this, but I'll take care of it later. If I forget, if I forgot, I can it in the slides. I rebuilt my slides for this term, so I think I forgot a slide somewhere. Okay. Now, I already discussed what an associative entity was. It has a very limited structure, the associative entity. Normally, it contains the primary keys of its parents, and that's all that's in there. So, for example, we have an employee ID, and we have a scale number. In here, we'd have employee ID and scale number. That's all that'd be in this. Now, that's all we need to actually identify the relationship between them. That's an associative entity. Now, there's something called an associative entity with attributes. It's a slightly more powerful. It's gone to the gym, and it actually did leg day. Because leg day sucks, but it took the time to do legs day. And it contains the primary keys from the associated tables, just like an associative entity. But it might contain other information, such as, okay, we have an employee. And he's got a skill. Um, so employee number five has a skill for PHP. And we have it in here. However, maybe dude's only been using PHP for a year. Whereas the other employee, let's call him Dan, has been using PHP for 17 years. So, you know, Maybe this guy is an, a beginner. This guy is an expert. Just a thought. Maybe. So maybe one of the other attributes you'd have on here is expertise level. Or if they have any certifications applied to it, when did they acquire a certification? Because certain skills can have certifications. You can get your Oracle certification. You can get your, your Microsoft certifications. Let's go with that one. Because I was about to say one that doesn't exist anymore. I almost dated myself again. So you could get your MSDBA, for example, right? So which are a set number of skills, and they're acquired on a certain. So that means you could mark a date of when that skill was acquired. Those are attributes. Normally, when you start doing stuff like that, things get a little more complicated. You end up ending, having to give this guy its own primary key. Because sometimes just these two is enough. So what happens if employee has a skill, and he ends up having the same skill more than once. I know it sounds dumb. Well, what happens if the guy had skill PHP and then he got his, you know, he got his one of those, what the heck was that? That website used to be called Brain something or other. Um, and you used to be able to get a certificate. That's prove you took a test online, you could take the test and prove you knew the language. And you could attach it so the guy would have PHP, but then he had PHP put on a second time because now he's been certified as a PHP master. Which all required is you to have two windows open, one with Google and one with PHP, with a test. So that's an associative entity with attributes. 
Okay, there's three major models. I think I've got like five slides left. And I'm just going to talk about the notation that I had up on the board. There's three major models. There's conceptual, logical, and physical. So, so far I've been talking about conceptual concepts. Conceptual diagrams includes the important entities and their relationships. So, oh, there was an eraser. But it, obviously it's not working very well because look at the board. So, you have the conceptual notation. And the conceptual notation is very basic. It defines the entities and their relationships. And at a conceptual level, many to many is allowed. This would be the connection between these two. And I'm pretty sure I've got the Crowsfoot notation somewhere in this slide. I hope. But you got many to many. So this is a conceptual diagram. I have two entities, employees and skills, and I describe the relationship. It's fairly simple. Um, there are slight variations on this notation. You can include the attributes. And you put them in a circle. That's date of birth. And there's one more notation for it, which would be, now what did I say about age versus date of, date of, date of birth? Age is a derived attribute. It goes in a dashed. So that's an entity, that's its attributes. And theoretically, if I wanted to, But an underline, now it's a candidate key. Hey? Yeah. Yeah. So, uh, one of the other things you'll see in this is a diamond. If that's known as a relationship I descriptor. Employee has skills. Yes. No. No, they're just derived attributes. They belong to this entity. This employee has an age. Later on, we just dump this because we don't need it. But at this stage, we are going to keep track of it because this is the stuff we showed our customers, our paying clients. They need to understand this stuff. And for them, they can understand simple little pictures like this as opposed to the more complex. Normally, you don't have primary keys at this level. Some people choose to put the primary keys here and then it becomes a logical diagram. The logical diagram, a little more complex than this. It includes all entities and the relationships between them. That means that if you have a many to many, you'll get rid of the many to many and create the association of entities. Uh, you will define all the primary keys. The foreign keys will be identified. And if there's normalization, this is when it happens. I'm not going to cover the logical diagram today, but that will be, will be next week. Now, the next stage after the logical is the physical. So you go from conceptual to logical, logical to physical. Physical specifies all tables and columns. Notice I'm not using the word entity anymore. An entity becomes a table, an attribute becomes a column slash field. Foreign keys are created and enforced. You may need to denormalize at this point, which I talk about normalization and denormalization later in the term, but there's a, at this point you may need to break down your data a little bit. You, there might be physical considerations that cause this to not work. For example, the conceptual diagram allows this kind of relationship drawn to be drawn like this. You know, an employee has many skills. Each skill can belong to many employees. There's no way to physically do that in the database server because they won't let you. 
Or if you do it, you're an idiot. It's doable. Actually, you can force the database server to do it, but it's a, you're, you're a dumbass if you do it. Therefore, you end up creating a social of entities, which means it's going to look different than your conceptual diagram because you're adding stuff to it. And each database server may cause a data, physical data model to be different. For example, a physical data model for Postgres will be different than it is for a Microsoft SQL server or MySQL. Why? Relationships aren't always enforced the same way. The data types are different. The definition of what is something's allowed to be called may be different from one server to another. The physical diagram will change from server to server. Okay. I'm just going to put a bit of notation up on the board so that and I'm pretty sure this is in one of the hybrids but I'm going to cover it in person just to be on the safe side. The one I'm talking about is the relationship notation. It's known as crow's foot, the one we use in this course. There's four or five common database notations out there. There's um, one defix, and then there's a couple of others. Uh, UML's picking up steam. But the original, no, that's not the original, but the second generation notation is known as crow's foot. And it uses four symbols. First of all, you have a line. That's rocket science. Let's show a line between two objects. These two things are connected. However, it's what happens at the end of the lines that are different. This means many. Okay? This means one. All right. So, the problem is I wish I had brought a different colored marker. So at this point, what we have is one to many. So this is the cardinality. So remember I talked about whether it's one or more. Now, the other op thing we have also is optionality. Again, I'm going to put this here. And a second line here, this one, one and only one. If I do this, this means one, the heck am I writing? Or more. A circle means zero or one. This means zero, one, or more. Sorry about the small writing at the back. So the three symbols are as follows. So you have this describes the cardinality. Is it, is it one or more? One or many? The next symbol on the inside means one either optional or not. And I'm pretty sure that's actually in one of the hybrids. So it is there. It's important to actually understand this notation because I'll be using it all term. Well, for the first half of the term at least. And you guys will have to learn to use it too. So make sure you do that hybrid because it covers it fairly well. That's hybrid two, one. Okay, even better. Hybrid one. Make sure you do hybrid one. Make more sense. Okay. Now the last item, and we all get to run away. It's naming conventions. Now this is important for later. However, I'm putting it out there today because there's never a really good place to put my naming conventions. These are not hard set rules for database land. These are Dan's rules for database land. Just making sure I'm clear. Now, naming conventions used to be loose and free. There once was a time where everybody did whatever the heck they wanted. So you'd go into a database and it was a nightmare. And also because we didn't have a lot of disk space, the naming conventions used to be pretty cryptic. Each company had its own standards. 
even each developer would have their own standards. I remember working on databases and every table looked a little different because each guy called had their own thing. Thanks to modern development frameworks, which started cropping up about seven, eight years ago, let's go, with something called the de facto standard starting to emerge. Do you guys know what de facto standard is? The concept of de facto standard? A de facto standard is a standard that is accepted by the industry but has not been formalized. That means that no formal standards, standards group has created the standard. For example, there's a standard for HTML4, there's a standard for HTML5, kind of. There's a standard for, you know, if you've heard of ISO 9001, if you ever see ISO 9001 inside of a building, it means their process follows certain rules all the time. Those are standards. A de facto standard means everybody agrees we're going to do it this way, but nobody's actually formally written it down and say this is what everybody must do. Because you will never get people in computers to ever agree that there's only one good way. So here are the naming conventions in my class. Everything is lowercase, no exceptions, no camel case. Please and thank you. I will deduct points. There is a reason for this. Reason number one, not all database servers treat object names the same way. Postgres, being a Unix system, is anal retentive about its case sensitivity. You might have experienced this in Java already that a lowercase variable name is not the same name as an uppercase variable name. Yeah, same deal in the database. Other database servers like MySQL and Microsoft SQL Server don't care unless you tell it to care. Oracle lies. It makes you pretend that it allows you to have mixed case objects and then when it stores it in the database server, it stores the mixed case version and an uppercase version so that it's case insensitive. Make everything lowercase, it'll work everywhere. Simple enough. No spaces, ever. The SQL language uses spaces as a keyword delimiter. That means if you put a space, it thinks you're giving it a new keyword. Use a underscore instead of a space. This is known as snake case. If you don't know what snake case is, go look it up on the internet. It's everything is lowercase and words are separate with underscores. It looks like a little snake. Tables are plural whenever possible. Exceptions do exist, such as log. Lo a log implies plurality. There's multiple entries inside of a log. Sometimes it causes a little bit of grief when you end up with a specific, specific phrase such as people and person, because you can have multiple persons, and you can have multiple peoples. But people is also a plural of person. That one gets a little iffy, so pick one and stick to it. That's all I got to say. But peoples is dumb. Primary keys are always called ID. Not employee ID, customer ID, that's just me. Um, and several frameworks out there. I've decided ID was what you should call it. Why? Because then the frameworks don't need to guess what your primary key is called. If everything is called ID, if the primary keys are always called ID, you can say, oh, I'm looking at countries. What's the, uh, the primary key of countries? ID. Now i got to go look up a customer. What's the primary key of the customer? ID. If it's called ID, it's obvious. Foreign keys are named using the rule of, and there's like a big, long rule. Is the singular parent table name underscore the primary key name? So, for example, there's a table called users, and it shouldn't be uppercase, it's just, you know, PowerPoint trying to get clever with its spelling correction. A users table has a primary key of ID, therefore, the foreign key would be called user ID. It is the ID of a user. Where do we find the user? In the users table. And how do we find that user inside the users table? We use the ID. Therefore, it's the ID of a user from the users table. That's the logic behind the naming convention. OK. There is a slide with the naming conventions. When you have an assignment, which you will, not today, but you will have an assignment, I am notorious for naming conventions. 
That's the place where students lose the most points, historically. Notwithstanding the, oh, I didn't bother do it, or, oh, I wasn't listening when Dan was talking about this in class, naming conventions. Now, one of the reasons why naming conventions are important, it leads back to one of the most important concepts in database. It's a magic word called consistency. If you are consistent with your design, it is usable. If your design is like a gerbil that ate a chocolate bar, it's not going to be usable. It's going to be all over the place. It will make no sense. Therefore, it's all about consistency. So if everything is lowercase, tables are always plural, primary keys are always called ID, it's consistent. If nothing else, I will teach you guys to be consistent before the end of this term. That's like the number one rule in database design is consistency. Number two is actually understanding what you're doing. You're going to get away with not understanding what you're doing if you're consistent. Well, not for long, but you can for a little while. Now, what should you be working on this week, just so you know? Number one, you should be doing hybrid two. You don't have to do it in lab. You can do it whenever you want. I just recommend you do it as you go. You should be finishing lab two and starting on lab three. Lab two is due at the end of the week. I would recommend you read one of those PDFs, those little PDFs that go with the units. Either if you haven't read the unit two PDF, I'd do that sooner than later. It covers some of these concepts I did today in different words. Maybe you might want to pre-read unit three just so that you've, you know, you come to class with a bit of background. Um, that's what you should be working on this week. Uh, for those of you that finally got their laptops and or their laptops finally got fixed, show me in lab, lab one, because you can't do lab two unless you did lab one. So it kind of goes together. Uh, yeah, I screwed up and I, yeah, I hit the wrong number when I put in lab one. So just fire me off an email to remind me and I'll fix it. Okay, other than that, guys, that's it. See you next week.